Buenos días. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, yo no hablo español, uh, so I will uh, speak English and I, I try to be as clear as possible. And I would like to thank for to start, uh, uh, of course, Emilia Giorgetti of the Italian Embassy, uh, the Italian Culture of uh, the Italian Institute of Culture, and Dr. Chavez for giving me the opportunity to be here. It is always a pleasure for me to be in, uh, in Mexico City. So uh, I'm a professor of history of medicine, and so between my task, uh, there is also to teach uh, to medical students medical ethics bio and bioethics. And I think that the history of, uh, of uh, medical ethics could be very useful uh, to understand the nature of, uh, of this uh, discipline. Uh, of course, uh, you, you, you know very well that medical ethics, medical deontology, and bioethics are slightly different disciplines because medical ethics is the general study of the moral uh, dilemma of the clinic related to medical clinical practice and medical basic, basic research, while medical deontology, deontology means duty, is the application of the reflection by medical ethics, and at the end, bioethics is a special case of, of ethics, of ethical reflection in medicine and biology, because it is related to the new technology introduced in medicine and in biology uh, since, let's say, the second half of the 20th century. And from, uh, we can say that medical ethics belong to medicine since its beginning, since its down in the 5th century before Christ. Uh, I will speak about um, just a, a table of content of, of my talk. I will speak about the milestone on, in medical deontology, so the ancient, the earliest text in medical deontology, of course, the Hippocratic Oath, but there are two more uh, quite interesting ancient texts. Um, then I, I will jump to the first book in which the term medical ethics was used, so medical ethics by Thomas Percival. I give just a brief mention, mention of, of that book. And then I will, I will focus, uh, I will draw your attention to the Renaissance because it was a crucial period, not only for the history of science, for the history of medicine, but also for the history of medical ethics. Because we can say that the, uh, this uh, discipline born at that time, right? And, uh, and I, I, I will focus to two, uh, on two uh, uh, quite significant and important texts on medical ethics. One written by Gabriele de Zerbi at the end of the 15th century, and the other one uh, written one century later by Leonardo Bottallo in 1565. So, uh, so the Hippocratic Oath uh, was uh, uh, written, produced in the 5th century before Christ within the Hippocratic School. The Hippocratic School it, it for um, Western medicine is absolutely crucial because it was the first medical school uh, which emancipated medicine from religion, right, from uh, uh, religious practice and religious institution. And so, uh, Hippocratic physician felt the necessity to have uh, their own moral code, different from the moral code typical, typical of uh, the, re the religion of that time. And uh, this is the complete ancient text. I would like just to draw your attention to three important features of this text. This, this text. Uh, first of all, in the, in the uh, Hippocratic Oath, the physician swear to be part of a um, corporation, of a professional corporation characterized by mutual help. Uh, the second moral principle, maybe the most important, the most famous, is uh, uh, the moral rule, first of all, do not help. Uh, um, in relation to the therapy, to the patients, and so on. And the third import, important feature, and the second most important moral uh, rule of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of this text, uh, is the confidentiality. Uh, whatever I see or hear in the lives of my patient, 
uh, I will keep secret, right? And of course, now uh, is, is not used anymore the classic, the original text, but uh, there is the modern uh, text. This one, for instance, was produced by the World Medical Association, I think, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, another early, very interesting text on medical ethics is the Formula Comitis Archiatrorum. It is a code of medical rule, rules established during the king of the, king of the barbarian Ostrogothic and by the, uh, the king Theodoric in the 5th century uh, um, of the Christian era, so one millennia after the Hippocratic Oath. It is uh, interesting because uh, it, um, uh, it concerns um, not a self-imposed moral uh, code by physician, but uh, um, it is related to moral uh, rules established by the king for the cow physician, right? And uh, uh, the, um, the, the manuscript of that text was reported by Cassiodorus, who was a Roman writer, uh, working at the court of uh, Theodoric. And uh, um, there are many uh, significant, import, important, interesting features of uh, this, uh, this text. Um, uh, one, uh, the first interesting is that uh, according to this code, to this moral code, the physician uh, had to continue to study and to continue to study all along his life. The other is that the physician had to uh, avoid disputations among, with, uh, with other physicians about the diagnosis, prognosis, uh, therapeutic, and so on. Um, there are, um, and that, uh, this is, uh, in some sense, why the king Theodoric felt the necessity to have a moral code, exactly because he need a chief physician, right, uh, who resolve discussion about the other court physician. So, the, 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 uh, among these uh, uh, features, be honest, continue to study, and so on, the, the third and the fourth are maybe the most significant uh, related to this uh, ancient text. And uh, the, the other early uh, text of medical ethics came from the Arab tradition, Adab al-Tabib, uh, which means uh, the conduct of a physician, written uh, by a Syrian uh, Arab physician, so, someone think that he was Catholic, but I, I, I don't believe him. Uh, he was really um, Arab and um, uh, with the Ara Arabic culture, and it was written around the 9th century of the Christian era. And uh, we, we found again that the, the physician had to be um, uh, have to uh, cure his personal health, uh, they, they have to respect the other physicians. We found a very interesting feature for the first time. Um, uh, the, the Arab author of, that, uh, of this code uh, felt the necessity to, uh, that medicine was, uh, um, had to be a, um, a profession established by a license as to, the, as to distinguish medicine, physicians, real physicians, from charlatans, from popular medicine and so on, right? And uh, another interesting uh, feature of this text, it is uh, for the first time, probably in the history of science, we have uh, the mention of the peer review, right? Because according to, to the Arab author of the text, the, uh, any physician to keep, should keep a record of the patient symptoms, right? And this record has to be reviewed by his peers, by his colleagues, right? As to establish the, the rightness, the correctness of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, record, of this clinical record, right? And uh, there are also some interesting duties of the patient. We have for the first time uh, uh, a discussion about patients 
and so patient uh, uh, to choose a physician for the knowledge and for the moral value, of course. And uh, uh, when a patient asks for, uh, for different medical advices, the patient has to inform all the physicians involved in the therapeutic process, right? Has to be, uh, as to, uh, up, as that the, 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 all the physicians could discuss the, the diagnosis, prognosis, and so on. So, um, uh, we, uh, generally, generally speaking, we found in these three uh, earliest texts some interesting features of medical ethics. So, the medical ethics was the expression of a, of a physician uh, as belonging to a professional corporation, a professional elite, uh, which have to preserve themselves uh, against, of course, charlatans, against uh, uh, anyone who, who try to uh, practice medicine without having studied medicine, without a license, an, office, or an officer license in medicine. But also physicians have to, uh, have to protect themselves uh, to the danger of being accused by the member of the count, by the population, let's say, by the patient, the relative of the patient, and so on, of malpractice, right? And so, the, um, the beginning of medical ethics uh, tell us that medical ethics uh, born with a double feet, with a, a double features. Uh, from, from the one hand, it was the uh, expression uh, um, of self-imposed uh, moral rules by the physicians themselves, and from the other uh, hand, it was uh, the expression of duties established by the community, by the king, uh, Theodoric, uh, and, and, and so on. All these features uh, jumped, were, uh, were elaborated uh, historian normally tell for the first time, but that, that's not, this is not really true. Uh, anyway, we well, elaborated in 1803 uh, with the first book using the term medical ethics. It was uh, written and published by Thomas Percival, who was a, a British physician, and uh, um, this book, I, I will not enter into detail, of course, because we have no time, not enough time. Anyway, it, was, it is considered the down of medical ethics. And all the, follow, uh, the, the, the following uh, text on that uh, discipline uh, referred to the medical ethics by Thomas Pierce, uh, uh, Percy. But in the meantime, uh, from the uh, ancient text and uh, Thomas Percival, there was the Renaissance. There was the Renaissance, which, which was a crucial period for medical science, of course, for science in, in general, and also for the establishment of a real, of a complete, let's say, medical, medical ethics. In fact, uh, it's, it's not a, a chance if it was exactly during this period that the Hippocratic Oath became a normative code thanks to the activity of the European universities. And uh, speaking about the Renaissance, uh, I will draw your attention, I, I will focus this last part of my lecture on a, on a special case uh, on the University of Bath. Uh, not only because it is my university, of course, but because uh, during the Renaissance, the University of Padua was probably the most important medical schools uh, in Europe. Um, uh, but of course, uh, all of you, you know that it is in north, uh, northeast of Italy, close to Venice, and it is very known for the, sorry, for the Basilica of uh, St. Anthony, where the mort mortal remains of uh, St. Anthony are still preserved. Um, anyway, um, the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Padua was inaugurated in 1399. But, as you probably know, Padua was, uh, mm, uh, the University of Padua, um, born um, uh, more than one century uh, before, in 1222, is the third uh, oldest university in the world. 
but uh, the university born uh, originally as a school of law for the study of law. Universitas in Latin was Universitas Artistana. Only in 1399, even if uh, medicine was uh, uh, thought even before that, that, uh, that year, but only in 1399, uh, the university was split, divided into two main schools, Universitas Juristarum for the study of law and Universitas Artistarum for the study of the arts. But the arts at that time mean medicine, philosophy and mathematics, right? So, since then, only since this period, not only for Padua, but for many other European Western universities, only since this period, anyone who would become a physician had to graduate to have a license, an official license, in a university, in a medical school. Before, it was not so. Um, the official medicine during the Renaissance, or uh, as also uh, Leonardo, the activity of Leonardo showed, the official medicine was an anatomically oriented medicine. Medicine was based on anatomy. This is a, a special feature of Western medicine. It is a um, anatomically oriented medicine. And in Padua, uh, were many, most of the most important anatomists of the of the Renaissance. Among them, I just would like to mention Alessandro Benedetti, Andrea Vesalius, Andreas Vesalius, of course, Matteo Rialdo Colombo, and Fabricius of Acquapendente. Benedetti, because the, he was the first to introduce the concept of the anatomical theater, right? So the place where dissection in the university, in the medical faculty, have to be done. Andrea Vesalius is the father of, uh, of modern human anatomy. Matteo Realdo Colombo was the discoverer of pulmonary circulation, while Fabricius Acquapendente was the founder, if, if, if this is not totally true, but it was the founder of the first stable anatomical theater in the world in 1594. Alessandro Andreas Vesalius published in 1543 the Humanis Corpus Fabrica Libri Septem. It is considered one of the most important uh, books on anatomy. And it is considered also the father of anatomical illustration because the book contained more than 200 uh, anatomical illustrations made by some of the most uh, skilled artists uh, coming from Venice. So here you have uh, just a few examples. So, um, uh, Vesalius is considered the father of anatomical illustration, even if Leonardo made even better anatomical illustration before Vesalius. But the only problem of Leonardo is that he never published his work. Right? His work remained almost unknown until the 19th century. So even for that time, it was uh, uh, true the motto, publish or perish, right? And uh, uh, Fabricius of Acquapendente is another very important figure because he introduced colored anatomical illustration. There are absolutely wonderful illustrations by Fabricius uh, preserved at the Marciana Library in Venice. And during his professorship, the first anatomic stable anatomical theater in the world was inaugurated in 1594 at the Bob Palace, which was the historical seat of the University of Padua, uh, seat of all the faculties of medicine, philosophy, theology, uh, law, and so on. And the uh, anatomical theater is still preserved at the uh, Bob Palace of our, of our university. And uh, during that period, during the Renaissance, there was another fu fundamental step for the official medicine. So, uh, in Europe, were uh, founded and inaugurated modern hospitals. So, places uh, dedicated only for the cure of uh, diseased individuals, right? And in Padua, in 1414, uh, it was founded the hospital of St. Francis in the heart of the town, not, not outside, in the heart of the town, so for the citizen of Padua and for curing diseases. 
and it was also the place where clinical teaching uh, started because we have a very important document uh, of the second half of the uh, 16th century where we found that the, the professor of the university started to bring their student from the university to the hospital, right, to practice with living patients. And this is a really uh, uh, fundamental change also in, uh, in, in, med in, in, in the medical science. And we found another uh, quite interesting feature that in the hospital, the, um, in the second half of the 20th century, or oh, sorry, of the uh, 16th century, patient, died patient, were um, dissected, right? Uh, we found that Bottoni and Otto decided to open the cadavers of those women, and also men, of course, in that case it's women, who died in the hospital. So physicians started to have the opportunity to see anatomical lesion, so the uh, uh, organ pathology, right? So we have the two official places of medicine, uh, university for medical license and hospital for practicing medicine. And in fact, during this period, the Hippocratic Oath became a normative code for, code for medical profession. And uh, uh, during this period, uh, we have the Board uh, of Medical Profession who found, who find itself in the necessity to protect medicine against, against from, the, from the one hand, the accusers of malpractice, because this office of medicine started to have new tasks. Uh, for instance, uh, deal with the epidemics, uh, uh, the, the administration of the town called the, the physician from the hospital in case of epidemics, or for medical legal tasks. And so there was also the risk to being accused of malpractice. And uh, um, 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 uh, medical ethics uh, born in that period or also for distinguish medicine from all the other non-orthodox uh, uh, practice of cure. Uh, the popular medicine, uh, the medicine done by old people, let's say, the medicine done by religious men, the med medicine uh, surgery, little surgery done by the barbers, the butchers, and the merchant of the merchant of herbs. So the officer of medicine felt felt the necessity felt the necessity to have a moral code to uh, to being clearly distinguished from the other. Uh, kind of uh, uh, non-official uh, medicine and medical practice. And uh, the, um, during this period, many books on medical ethics and medical deontology were written and published. Among them, I would like to mention just two of them, very interesting. I, I, of course, I, will I, will, uh, I, I, I have not the time to enter into the detail of these uh, these books, but uh, believe me, uh, they are very, very interesting for many reasons. Uh, the first one is the Cautelis Medicorum, written by Gabriele De Zerbi, who was a, a, who, uh, born in Verona, uh, was professor of medicine in Bologna and then in Rome, where he died in 1505. Uh, he, he, uh, he did important works, he gave important contributions. Uh, in uh, uh, geriatric diseases, was the first, uh, he, he, write, he wrote the first book on geriatric disease, Gerontocomia, in 14, uh, 1489. Uh, he was one of the most important pre vesalian anatomists, and of course, uh, he, he wrote uh, and published one of the first handbook of medical ethics, De Cautelis Medicorum. The, the title itself is very significant. It's not a, a matter of uh, ethical philosophy, let's say, but it, let's say it's a matter of prudence, of self-preservation of medicine. Uh, the prudence, it was a, a, a quality uh, 
related also to medicine itself because uh, the prudence look at the past, at the past, at the present, and at the future. And medicine uh, it has uh, it had the same characteristic. And uh, um, with the, the therapy, we found really the um, uh, the awareness by physician to belong to a professional corporation with license, with a specific place of learning, teaching, and practicing. Um, um, the prudence of the Zerbi was uh, the avoidance through diligent, I, I'm quoting the text, avoiding through diligent detection of deception, fraud, infamy, and dishonor, which happened to the doctor in the act of operating the human body. Uh, it was uh, divided into five uh, chapters, and uh, probably the, the most interesting chapters are the, are the last two, the chapter four and five. Um, because here we find really uh, some maybe even non-really ethical advices, right? Uh, uh, the first one, one of the, of the most interesting, uh, in some sense even funny, uh, it is that um, uh, the therapy advise physician to spend to spend a long time with their patient, even more than it is necessary. Necessary from a therapeutic uh, point of view, I mean. Um, and for instance, he, he advised at every visit the doctors try to, to, to do something new, even if it, it is not really necessary ordering, exchanging, subtracting, or adding, so that it does not seem, it does not appear uh, that he has visited the patient in vain, right? So, one of the basic rules of a uh, doctor of, the, of that time was to spend a long time with patient, even more than strictly necessary from a biological point of view, uh, to appear the diligent. Uh, the other very strange for, for our maybe culture uh, advice, pure prudence, is that uh, the physician has to delay as long as possible the, the prognosis, and he has with parent, with parent, with patient, and with the relative of the patient, he, he had to remain always vague. Right, he has not to speak uh, very clear about the diagnosis, about the prognosis, and so on, as to avoid being accused in, retro in retrospect of having committed an error. This is not really ethical <laughs> from our point of view, uh, no. Um, and the other prudence, this one is uh, really surprising. Um, uh, the therapy, the therapy um, tell that uh, um, the physician, if a physician is not sure about uh, a, a disease, the better thing is to worst the disease, right? So that if the patient heal, the, the patient will be very happy and will congratulate to the physician, to the, to the physician. If the patient died, the physician will be excused by the uh, by the bad prognosis that he had he had done, right? Another interesting uh, rule: never speaking badly badly of a colleague. So we found uh, the concept of medical cooperation with mutual uh, help uh, of a colleague in public, and if a colleague has committed an error, to correct him in secret, not in public, right? And this this aspect was explored. Uh, in a personal medical ethics. So, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm just finished. Um, we found in, the, in this trade, in this work, which is, is very, very interesting, very nice, from, from, from uh, in some sense also funny, uh, as I told you, we found a very peculiar mixture of Hippocratic, Catholic uh, ethics, and also cynicism and astuteness just to preserve medical medical profession. Uh, to, to, to conclude, uh, I, I would like to talk about uh, Leonardo Botallo Commentarioli Duo. Maybe it's a, a little less uh, um, strange as a, as a book uh, of medical ethics than uh, the therapy one. Um, uh, 
also here we found the necessity to a continuum study of, uh, of physician. The physician has to be clean, healthy, of course. Uh, here also we found uh, the need to write uh, clinical reports or, or about their patient to discuss with the other uh, physicians, with the other colleagues. We found for the first time the need to establish an alliance between internal medicine and surgery. So again, the idea of uh, uh, professional cooperation, including both medicine and surgery, and uh, avoid any kind of popular medicine, non-orthodox medicine, and solidarity also with, with poor patient. Here also we found that, that it, it, it could be useful to predict a mortal outcome of a disease, just to avoid uh, the accuser of, of, of practice, we found the necessity to use the ambiguous and hypothetic words. We found for the first time uh, the mention of the, um, that the physician uh, had not to share interest with pharmacists, right, so um, an important uh, ethical, ethical legal uh, issue. And uh, um, we found also some interesting duties of the patient and of the assistant, assistants of, of physicians. Uh, the patient have never to take something without the advice or the approval of his doctors and, and so on. And at the end also here we found that it is uh, to, to have a good name for a physician is important not only for the physician itself, but for the whole medical corporation, right? So, to conclude, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, finished now, um, why do medicine need a moral code? I think that, big, why there is the, this necessity exactly for medicine, to have a moral code? Uh, I think that uh, the Zerbi and Botallo uh, works, uh, such as the many others works, uh, of the Renaissance, on medical ethics of the Renaissance, are useful to answer uh, to that question. Because during the Renaissance, medicine became a profession, a structured profession with a curriculum, with a license, with a special place of, uh, for working in hospitals. So, uh, medicine uh, became the possible object of rivalry of the many competitors in the healthcare market, so medicine has to protect itself, and a way to protect itself is to uh, show to the community that official medicine has had a precise moral code. The moral code is a guarantee of the good practice of the official medical uh, profession and also uh, have to be protected by the judgment of the, by, from the judgment by the community because uh, uh, the prof new professional medicine find involved in many social tasks such as a deal with epidemics, uh, doing uh, autopsies in uh, uh, medical and uh, legal cases and so on. And uh, the moral code was a guarantee of the good practice of medicine. And so, um, I think that the history of medical ethics is uh, significant also from another gen more general uh, idea. It is another mark of the fundamental ambiguity of medicine. Medicine, it, it is a very ambiguous science. Not science, a very ambiguous dis discipline, practice. Because as you know, medicine, it is an art, uh, technological practice, but it is also a science. Medicine deals with patients, so with individuals, but it studies diseases, something more universal and general. And medicine has an uh, ethic which is uh, a self, the production of self-imposed uh, moral rules, uh, as well as uh, a medical ethics with, from the other end, it is uh, the production of externally imposed moral rules by the, by the social, uh, the, the, the society, the community, and, and so on. Many thanks for your attention.